April's Fellowship Luncheon will be Sunday, April 21st after the 11 a.m. worship service in the Fellowship Hall. This month's fair is fried chicken. Are you in need of prayer? For yourself? For someone you know? Are you feeling that tug to pray? You are in luck. The Royster Prayer Group meets on the first and third Tuesday of each month. The meetings start at 5.30 p.m. in the John Monroe Chapel. Our prayer meetings are open to everyone. Please join us as we become a praying church. Hello Royster family. Calvin here to talk about Pride Fest 2024. Royster has registered to participate in Pride on Saturday, June 22nd. We are now accepting volunteers to staff our table between 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. in one hour increments. Contact Anna Wachter if you are willing to volunteer for this important event. And as always, Royster is a place where everyone is welcome, even me. The Royster Presbyterian women have formed their circles. The circles meet on the second Tuesday of each month. The afternoon circle meets at 1 p.m. The evening circle meets at 5.30 p.m. All women of Royster are invited. Contact Jill Kiefer for more information regarding the afternoon circle and Anna Wachter for the evening circle. The Bible study group continues their study of the Old Testament. They meet on the first and third Wednesday of each month at 6 p.m. in the John Monroe Chapel. Everyone is encouraged to attend as we learn God's word together. Contact Anna Wachter or Pastor Brian Haroff for more information. The Royster Crafters Club continues to meet on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. The crafters meet in the church parlor at 5.30 p.m. If you like to quilt, crochet, draw, or just want to learn, come and join the Crafters Club for fun and fellowship. All crafts are welcome. Hello all, Ava here. Did you know that the Sunday morning book study class has identified the next book they are going to dive into? Yes, they did. And the book is called How the Bible Actually Works by Peter Enns. They will begin the study on Sunday, April 7th at 10 a.m. in the John Monroe Chapel and will continue for 14 weeks. They will study a different chapter each week. Royster has begun a gospel study around the biblical television show, The Chosen. We will meet on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at 6 p.m. in the John Monroe Room. For more information, please contact Pastor Brian Harriff or Anna Wachter. We will watch a new episode together for each week. After we watch the episode, we will discuss the episode and how it relates and differs from the Gospels. All participants are encouraged to bring a personal snack or meal. See you there. May's Fellowship Luncheon will be Sunday, May 19, after the 11 a.m. worship service in the Fellowship Hall. May's Fair is Nachos.
Excuse me? What's up, man? How's everything? Excuse me. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to a beautiful sunny day. Had a nice time. I stayed at the house and did some stuff in the yard, but... Uh, enjoyed my week away, and I thank Reverend Goodbo for filling in while I was gone. Uh, the one question that uh, John Stafford and I both have was, did anybody wish happy birthday on the first Sunday? Ah, yeah. uh, you saved it for John. God help us all. Well, good morning, folks. Welcome morning. to church. Holy ground that you're standing on. Believe that. And also, we are blessed to have the folks that are celebrating a birthday here in April. And also, an anniversary. If you have an anniversary in April, we are so glad for you. We praise the Lord for you. We love you. And may we all meet again don't wish us dead yet lord have mercy <laughs> so if you weren't blinded by the poetry of his words you'll notice that his outfit is rather striking as well the uh, the shirts are in, so if you have uh, ordered a shirt, that's they are available. Uh, that's the T-shirt. Yesterday during the funeral, Jeff was sporting the uh, 
the golf shirt out there representing. So it was, they are in, they're nice. Uh, we are starting to have requests to put another order in. So if you see, if you're just smitten by the beauty of John Stafford, you can let us know and we will, <laughs> we will get you a t-shirt. <laughs> uh, and then speaking of beauty, we've got crowns coming up at Wycliffe at what time? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. So that is a celebration of some of the African-American history around hats and some song. And Cassie, I understand you're doing three solos. So you, Cassie will be performing and our, our dear friend, uh, Veronica, Pastor Veronica Thomas will be also doing a bit of the emceeing, I guess you would call it. Uh, <coughs> oh, and our own Sharon Foxwell is gonna play. All right, so we will be well represented. Uh, I encourage you to head on over to Wycliffe off of uh, Great Neck Boulevard if you are interested in that. Are there any other announcements? We come into the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Let us lift up our hearts and worship the Lord. Good morning. I'm going to try something a little different this morning. And guess what? I'm not going to call anybody, but I'm going to use this phone if I can get things squared away.
It's up here somewhere. I was flunking out of college at a 1.7 grade point average. I've kept God in my life and has kept me humble. I didn't always stick with him, but he always stuck with me. I pray that you put your slippers way under the bed tonight so that when you wake up in the morning, you have to get on your knees to reach them. And while you're down there, say thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for wisdom. Say thank you in advance for what is already yours. True desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's yours already. And anything you want, you can have. So claim it. When you get it, reach back. Pull someone else up. Don't just aspire to make a living. Aspire to make a difference. All right. I hope that gave you some inspiration. All right. Now, with that in mind, I would like everybody to say thank you. Fantastic. Let us now clear our minds and hearts in preparation for the morning service. Oh God, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O oh God, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. O oh God, be gracious to us and hear our prayers. Let us worship God. You may be seated. <clears throat> See what love God has given us, that we should be called God's children. It 
does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when God appears, we shall be in God's likeness. Everyone who thus hopes in God is made pure, as God is pure. Whoever does right is righteous, as God is righteous. may be seated. Let us pray. God, source of all light, by your word, you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open to know your truth and your way. Amen. New Testament reading is taken from 1 John, third chapter, first through the seventh verse. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know it is that the world did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have the hope of him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either him, has no one who sins has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Luke 24, 36b through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? 
And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. You, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, we come again to your ancient word, seeking the inspiration of your living word. May your living word move in, through, and even in spite of the words of my mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody asked me this week, uh, just in a conversation, how far out I plan my sermons, and I told them rather jokingly, kind of, sort of, that I'm not sure what I'm going to preach Sunday. <laughs> and I should have heard the warning in that, because I wasn't sure what I was going to preach. Um, the, this weekend, my brother came into town, and our interactions have changed what I am preaching. And so you'll have to bear with me. I'm not exactly sure which way to come at this. But I'm going to start by giving you just a little bit of background on what, it, what the church of my youth was like. I am a cradle Presbyterian. My, great, my grandmother, my father's mother, was the daughter of a Presbyterian. Presbyterian minister, and she had several brothers who were Presbyterian ministers and a sister who was a Presbyterian missionary. She was the ninth of 11 children born in 1908, and she got her bachelor's degree from Muskingum University, which is a Presbyterian university in Ohio, which, if you know anything about our history, a female born in 1908 it wasn't a foregone conclusion that you would be educated, but she was. And so I've always been in the church, and the church of my youth did wonderful things for me. We had services not much different from this. Sunday school had a lot of education to it. My life with my grandmother, who was in Youngstown, which was about a three-hour drive from Columbus, was also a very heady understanding of religion. I can remember sitting around the table playing cards with my grandparents and my brother and sister and my father 
and my father irritating his mother because she said he had too much pride. And the discussion was literally on the difference between Methodist and Presbyterian, saying things about Calvin and Arminian and, you know, pride goeth before a fall and all sin is pride. And, and it was all this deep understanding of theology, but it was all very heady. There were no prayer meetings in the Presbyterian church that I attended. There was no Lent in the Presbyterian church that I attended. Lent was for the Catholics down the street. We knew that they gave up meat on Friday and had fish. And we knew that they put the ashes on their foreheads, but that was all Catholic things. We were very much in our heads. And so that's some background that I'll get back to, and there was just no good way to insert that into what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this, 20 ver this verse 24, 46, and 47, specifically 47, that repentance and forgiveness of sins be proclaimed. On Easter, I talked about how we have walked away, we fear judgment. And so the world has walked away from the church as though we are judging. But what we've ended up with is a world without forgiveness that we hammer on ourselves constantly. And that we don't understand this forgiveness stuff. But what I didn't realize until this weekend is that the thing that makes it the hardest is the repentance that we don't understand repentance. Now let me get back to this forgiveness first. Charles Taylor was a philosopher up in Canada, and he does a wonderful, I think, enumeration of what our society looks like. He says that there's a triangle, and that we all feel this guilt, this guilt at night, you know, that says, I haven't lived into my fullest capacity. I am not doing things exactly as I want to do them. And I, we hammer on ourselves at night. And he says there are three ways that people come to it, three corners of a triangle. And, and we're all somewhere between these three. And he says that one of them is a humanist way of coming at it. And in that, we understand that the social order must be organized, he says, around mutual benefits. He calls it the modern moral order. He says that, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be your full self, and you have to let other people be their full selves. You have to be able to express your truest desire in, in, in its purest form. Who you are matters, that that, that is... If you could just be your full self, you wouldn't have to feel guilty at night. And so there would be some source of forgiveness that's not God. It's purely inside me. But if I could just be who I really wanted to be, I wouldn't have to feel bad. And because I can't, in our society that so easily turns to rage, that you're not respecting who I am as a person and you are keeping me from being who I want to be, and so I end up guilty at night. It's a search for forgiveness. The other side, he says, is what he calls Neo-Nietzscheans. And that's somebody who sees, if we could just be heroic enough if we could just do the things that we are supposed to do, you know, he says that, that they want, that they are absolutely against this other side. And you can start to see this in our political culture when I say this one. You may not got the first one, but when I say the second one, both will become clear. He says this, this Nietzschean thing views the other side as snowflakes. Starting to make sense? That they want hugs, not merit. They're not bold. They just want everything to be soft for them, make a space for them, when what you need is to be heroic and bold enough to forge a space. And that if we were all heroic enough, we wouldn't need to feel guilty at night. We wouldn't need to beat ourselves up. We could be the people that we want. We could have the nation that we want. 
but other people are getting in the way. See how it starts to get to outrage again? And both of these sides of the triangle, he says, deal with trying to come to forgiveness and some idea of transcendence. I can transcend who I am if I really had my authentic self. I could can transcend all of the limitations on me if I could really be heroic. All of this stuff happens without God. And then there are these weird people who believe in God. And those people surrender to the fact that they're not magnificent. They confess that they are not magnificent, that they cannot greatness themselves or authentic themselves away from feeling guilt, but we can take it to God. Those are the three poles, and we're all somewhere in those areas, Charles Taylor says. And then we come to the church of my youth. And we come to my discussion with my brother. My brother was coming down to work with my mother. He and I had a meeting with her care facility, and we were, he was coming down for that. And he came in on Friday, and he got delayed by traffic on the way down. And as God would have it, he didn't arrive until about 7 o'clock. And he had texted my daughters during the week, and they knew he was coming. As God would have it, both of them forgot. My wife is at her father's in Hayside, Virginia, on the western side of the state. And so my brother and I are alone in the house with some adult beverages, and the conversation flows late into Sunday, Saturday morning. And I think I've told some of you before, but my, some of you may not have heard. In 2002, my brother was a navigator on Special Forces flight in Afghanistan. And they landed in, an, on, in a mountain range, and they loaded up a Humvee of Army Rangers and they began to take off, and the Humvee, the Humvee was seriously overloaded, and the mountain air was seriously thin, and they got about 10 stories high and came back down. Three people lost their lives. The rest of them waited until they could be rescued behind enemy lines and taken to Kandahar. And so my brother is in this position of having done what Charles Taylor says to do. He surrendered because you could not. He was 10 stories high with a co-pilot chirping to the pilot constantly, more power, more power, more power, and cannot get enough power. And it is enough time to think about the fact that you are about to die. They were behind enemy lines, but as soon as everybody was on board and the plane started, the sidearms are taken off, the flak jackets are taken off, the helmets are taken off, because if this plane goes down, you're dead. And so, as the plane starts to come back down, there are moments of understanding that you are dead. And those moments are moments of surrender. If you are down towards Charles Taylor's pole of authentic, if I could just be my authentic self, you, I would not feel guilty. You understand that in that moment, you cannot be authentic enough to get that plane to get back up into the air. There is nothing authentic about you that is going to stop this death. And if you're sitting in the navigator's seat, you understand that there is nothing heroic that you can do. You can't be man enough to stop this. You can't be American enough to stop this. You can't be smart enough to stop this. You are about to die. And so he surrendered to that. 
Now, he didn't die. But now he lives in this stew where he's not on the other polls that Charles Taylor announces because it's all been made apparent to him that you can't do that. That he can't fix his life by being perfect enough because he's faced death in a traumatic way as a young man with young kids at home. So he has surrendered to that. But the church of my youth did not infuse him with an understanding of a God that could help. And so my brother is also an aeronautical, astronautical engineer and a very scientific mind cannot find God. Cannot find what to grab hold of in this world. You don't understand how much forgiveness of sins equates to love until you sit with somebody who cannot find God but understands that the things that this society says, either be woke enough or MAGA enough, don't fill the bill either. The church of my youth taught him about the Bible. They taught him about Jesus. He can name Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He can name Jonah and the whale. He can name all of these things. But they did not introduce him to the Jesus Christ who forgives him and has a personal relationship with him. And it did not enable his repentance. Not repentance because he behaves badly. But repentance as in change your mind to understand that all of the nonsense that this culture says exists without God is nonsense and that God is here and that God loves you and that this God has forgiven your sins. When Jesus says repent and forgiveness of sins and this is what should be preach, he is talking about how much you are loved and that this world will tell you that the one who loves you the most and the only one who can forgive you and who does forgive you doesn't exist. That's what this world has told my brother over and over and over again. And the church of his youth just gave him facts. And facts don't help. And God love them, but the chaplain in Kandahar just wanted him back in a cockpit and so told him never to love anything on this earth including his three-year-old and four-year-old sons more than he loved God which is utter nonsense I'd use another word and I almost did but <laughs> the good Lord help me <laughs> and so what do we do as a church what do we do as those who gather in this room and understand that there is a higher power and that this higher power has forgiven us and loves us? What do we do as people whose minds have been changed? How do we own our repentance? I keep hearing that word repentance, 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 and it means change my behavior. It's not. It's changed my mind to understand that there is this God, and this God loves me. That has already been done. I have repented. You have repented. If you are coming to church, you understand that there is a God in this world, unless you're being drugged by somebody else, and then you're on your own. You understand, we have repented. But do you see the damage I did sitting with him? I see the damage of a church that never introduced me to this God. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. Is there anything that I have done in my ministry weirder than start prayer meetings? In a Presbyterian church, if you were raised like me, there's nothing weirder that a pastor could do. Why do that? Because if you don't meet this God, 
if you don't experience this God with other people, when eventually the other points on those triangles break down, what are you left with when you have to surrender and you understand that you're not immortal? If you don't know this God, you stand where my brother has been for 20 years. not even knowing how much he needs God. These things, repentance and forgiveness of sins, are not about our heads. They're not analytical concepts. This is about understanding that there is a God and that that God loves you. Understanding that in your heart. And I cannot say it from this pulpit and put it in your heart. I cannot. I can pray that God put his fist in your back and bring you to a prayer meeting or into prayer in your own lives in a way that God can show you that this God is real because you will need it. Not just when we're giving your eulogy, but you will need it in this world. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. If we tell you about God in this church, but we do not introduce you to God, we have failed you miserably. Let me ask you and invite you. Tuesday is another one. Come to a prayer meeting. Come just to be in the presence of this God so that you might learn what my brother so desperately needs to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us now stand and repeat the affirmation of faith. For those of you who are new to the church or haven't been here before, if you turn to page 14, it is written, and you can follow along. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
us pray. Holy God, you have gathered us. You have called us. You have forgiven us. Change our minds, Lord, that we might know you better. Lord, we pause as your people now <coughs> to pray for this world, to pray for the turmoil in the Middle East, the war that is ever deepening and widening. We ask your strength and your guidance in that region. We ask that it be contained and not engulf the entire planet, Lord. We pray for those being killed. We pray for those being sent to kill. And Holy God, we pray for those in our midst who know of you but do not know you. Lord, we bring you our prayers as much as we bring you our time and our treasure and our talents, and we ask that you bless it them as well you are our god and we are your people hear us as we pray the prayer that jesus taught saying our father who art in heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
in the midst of a culture that constantly tells us that either God does not exist or if he does, he doesn't care. Or if he cares, he's mad at you. I say change your mind. Change your mind. Repent and know that this God loves you and forgives you. And in order to do that, you must experience this God. You cannot just learn about him. Repent and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And may the Lord remain between me and thee while we are apart each from the other. Amen and amen.